Hello, very warm welcome to Middle East Matters. I'm Sanam Chantier. Coming up on our program this week, children's shipwreck. Italian authorities are in the dock six years after 268 Syrian refugees, including 60 children, lost their lives in a shipwreck. Saudi Arabia takes over the G20 presidency this amid an uproar over the Conservative Kingdom's human rights record. Also coming up on our program this week, the Israeli-Palestinian conflict will be speaking to a representative from the Alliance for Middle East Peace, an organization that's promoting dialogue between the two sides. John Linden will delve into the various youth-centric projects with us. But first, an unprecedented court case was set to start this week but has been postponed to May 2020. Two Italian officers stand trial for manslaughter and non-assistance to persons in danger. Now, Back in October 2013, a boat carrying mostly Syrian asylum seekers sank in the Mediterranean. Among the 268 people who drowned, there were 60 children. Today, survivors are accusing Italian authorities of failing to provide prompt assistance despite numerous distress calls. Hello? Yes. yes. About 100 children and 100 women and the boat is going down. Yes. I swear to you, there about half liter water in, in, it, in, the, bo in the boat. Water is coming into it. Please hurry, please hurry. For nearly five hours, those increasingly desperate calls from a sinking ship were ignored as Italian and Maltese authorities passed the buck. By the time an Italian patrol ship arrived, the boat carrying 480 Syrian migrants had capsized. Less than half of the people on board were saved. Syrian Kurdish doctor Hassan Wahid survived but lost his four daughters that day on October the 11th, 2013. Our first SOS call was at midday, and the boat capsized at 5 p.m., so that's five hours later. For me, that's intentional, cold-blooded murder. It's simply not possible to deny assistance to people who've been begging for your help for hours. It's a crime. For five years, the Italian justice system refused to accept this version of the event until the media revealed the recordings of the distress calls. Now, two officials from the Italian Navy and Coast Guard Service could face up to 15 years in prison for negligent homicide. As part of their defence, they accuse Malta of badly coordinating the rescue operation. The Maltese authorities created confusion amongst the Italian authorities. When a member state of the European Union takes control of operations and the incident takes place in their territorial waters, one expects them to intervene. Even though the boat was in an area of Maltese responsibility, its GPS position was closer to the Italian island of Lampedusa. I call Malta. They said that we are near to Lampedusa more than Malta. I guess position. You are the proximity for us. We are dying, please. <laughs> okay, you are. Uh, you are. Uh, we are dying. Don't do us. Call Malta. Please. Call no, Malta. I, I have no enough account on the mobile. If you can, please. Yes, you have to call Malta, sir. You have to call Malta. About 20 families of victims are civil parties in this court case. With the trial being postponed due to a lawyer's strike, they will have to wait until next May to bring those responsible to justice and start grieving for their loved ones. Now, after two months of unrelenting protests, unrest continues across Iraq and the death toll continues to climb. And the resignation of the country's prime minister has done little to appease the opposition movement. Meanwhile, politicians and their regional allies have gathered in the capital, Baghdad, to discuss a way out of the largest mobilization the country has witnessed in years. Iraqis are angry over poverty, youth unemployment, corruption, as well as Iran's influence in the country. Moving on, Saudi Arabia has become the first Arab nation to take over the G20 presidency. The move has been slammed by critics 
as it comes amid a new wave of arrests. The ultra-conservative kingdom also faces sustained criticism following last year's killing of prominent journalist Jamal Khashoggi, as well as its role in the devastating Yemen conflict. Now, as the young crown prince Mohammed bin Salman seeks to bounce back onto the world stage, all eyes are on the country's state oil giant Aramco ahead of a stock market debut. Known as Saudi Arabia's crown jewel, its state-owned oil giant is one of the world's most profitable companies. And for the first time ever, shareholders will be able to get in on the action as Saudi Aramco prepares to float a 1.5% stake on the Saudi stock exchange. It's expected to raise over 25 billion US dollars, making it the biggest IPO ever and a welcome cash injection. The profits from listing Aramco will go to the National Investment Fund to target promising investment sectors inside and outside the kingdom. But the real driver behind the change isn't the king, but the king's heir, Prince Mohammed bin Salman. He wants to use the money raised to develop infrastructure, encourage tourism and diversify the economy, which up until now has been almost entirely dependent on the oil industry. That's the paradox. To diversify away from petrol, they need to have petrol and its revenue so that they can invest in diversifying economically, which is the number one project of Prince Mohammed bin Salman. And that's what he'll be judged on long term. He's promised the country's youth good jobs off the back of this diversification. Saudi Arabia's prince has had to rein in his ambitions as the IPO has met with teething problems. It was originally supposed to raise 100 billion. Foreign investors feel the company has been overvalued and have stayed away. The percentage to be floated was initially 5% and later scaled back. And plans to list on a Western stock exchange were abandoned over the level of transparency required. As a result, most of the future shareholders will be domestic or regional. Now to a conflict that has riddled the region for decades. At the heart of that, at times, violent quagmire, a dispute over land between Israelis and Palestinians. Now, one solution which today seems like a distant dream is the two-state solution in which both Israel and Palestine become independent states. And one organization is trying at least to foster dialogue between the two sides. Alliance for Middle East Peace is a network of around 100 NGOs promoting people to people peace building. And its executive director joins me today on Middle East Matters. John Linden, thanks so much for being with us. Good to be with you, Sanam. Thank you. Now, we're talking about two very largely young populations here. And because of that, OMAP uh, is promoting various youth-centric projects in a bid to try and transform attitudes, if they can, earlier in life. Yeah, I mean, look, in conflict, generally speaking, the opinion formation age, sort of sometime in the mid to late teens, is critically important with regards to framing what people think about big, important questions around identity and politics for the rest of their lives. But it's particularly true in Israel and Palestine because you've got very young populations. I mean, the median age between the river and the sea is about 24 uh, when you look at Israelis and Palestinians, and it's even younger when you focus just on Palestinians, about 17 in Gaza and 19 in the West Bank. And if you think about the lived experience of Israelis and Palestinians over over, over their short lives, um, it's been horrific. It's this, this generation uh, of both sides, we've never handed a worse set of circumstances to an emerging generation. It's been a failure on the international community's part, uh, also on the local politicians. And I think, you know, not just in general conflict resolution theory, but specifically with Israel-Palestine, if we don't disrupt some of the youth attitudes that we're seeing, the conflict will escalate, not resolve. And it's, uh, it's something we all have a responsibility, I think, to, to take account for and see if it can be disrupted. And staying with that, can you talk us through one of of the projects that for you certainly stands out most? Yeah, I mean, the several of our members are focused specifically on that younger cohort. Uh, for example, Kids for Peace is an organization working specifically inside Jerusalem, and it tends to focus more on young people where faith is a big part of their lives. Sometimes a critique of the peace building community is that it's too secular or too sort of traditionally left leaning. And Kids for Peace completely um, goes against that, that observation. And it's, it's young people who are uh, of faith mostly living in the city of Jerusalem where the big psychological 
psychological barriers to contact, but fewer of the physical ones that exist between Israelis and Palestinians more generally. One of the activities they do that I find really inspiring is they go through the old city of Jerusalem together and talk about their experience of growing up in that city from the different faith and national perspectives they share. And what's interesting is they don't elide the politics. This isn't just about being together and getting to know one another. They address and confront the most difficult issues. And I think it puts them in a place where, as emerging adults, they could be really uh, the leaders that we need to see emerge for tomorrow. John, you mentioned something earlier. This emerging generation has very much been let down by the international yeah. community. I'd like to know how they react to someone like you, an outsider, if you like, going in. Do they reject that in any way? Uh, sometimes, uh, you know, so, you know, people often think that they're slightly narcissistic about their own conflict. I saw it in Ireland, too, where people say, no, there's never been a conflict like ours before. And I think it's important for outsiders to be uh, careful and considered in the way that they engage. But I also think it's important for the international community to try and play uh, a role in mediating or disrupting conflict. In Ireland, where I come from, we were very lucky in that the international community saw our conflict as a problem to be solved rather than a political football to kick around. And they invested at scale via the international for Ireland to really transform youth attitudes 12 years before a peace uh, deal. That's what we're trying to achieve at AllMap, to create this big fund that would allow um, interaction with the other to be a right that every Israeli and Palestinian enjoys rather than a rare privilege that, that, that too few people get access to. And that's something we can do as outsiders that's going to be very, very difficult for the parties themselves to be able to create. As we just mentioned, neither the global community nor local leaders have been able to do anything. How effective can grassroots projects like this actually be? Very briefly, if you can, John. Um, I think everything is downstream uh, from the, the attitudes of Israelis and Palestinians. So the broken politics you see are a function of the lived experience. So it's, it's critical. It's necessary, but not sufficient on its own. Civil society can be an engine room for new leaders to emerge, new ideas to be socialized, and for the politics that we see so broken now to be corrected or disrupted or just rearranged. And essentially, if we get this piece right, and we have a little bit of patience, we can actually see new factors emerge that deck of cards be reshuffled and some of the paradigm, the problems of the paradigm we see at the moment may be um, dissolved away. So much patience needed there. John Linden of the Alliance for Middle East Peace, thank you so much for being with us on Middle East Matters. And thank you for watching this edition of the show. Do stay tuned to France 24.